Hey guys, I'm here to do something different today, and I talked about it in my previous video with uh, Black Panther Wakanda Forever. I thought about doing a breakdown of certain military movies or military-themed films. Given my past experience in the military, I thought it'd be necessary to tell some of you guys what my experiences were and give you my thoughts on how I think certain movies get certain things right and how others maybe take artistic liberties, if that's the way, best way to put them. I just realized I should have put this over here. <laughs> it's right out of my sight. I would not consider myself an encyclopedic expert on the military. I was in the Army National Guard for six years, 2012 to 2018. I got out about four years ago. Army National Guard is the reserve component of the US Army. We call basically when we're needed in the case of a war or a natural disaster. I didn't deploy, never saw combat, thankfully. If I had to guess, I think most people who go into the service don't really experience that. If this were 15 years ago during Iraq or Afghanistan, the numbers might be a little bit higher, but it's a very different time period that we're living in, so take what I say from what you will. First up, Jarhead. You are no longer black, or brown, or yellow, or red. You are now green. You are light green, or dark green. Do you understand? Sir, yes, sir! Swafford. Sir, yes, sir! You the maggot whose father served in Vietnam? Sir, yes, sir! Outstanding! It's Smokey the Bear Hat. To die there. Oh, sir, man. no, sir! Too f***ing bad! <laughs> Are you eyeballing me with those baby blues? Are hey, you? you're not supposed to look sir, at an no, instructor or drill sergeant. Are you sergeant. in love with me, Swafford? <laughs> sir, no, sir! Oh, you don't think I look good in my uniform, Swafford? Sir, the drill instructor looks fabulous in his uniform, sir! Oh, so you're gay then, and you love me, huh? <laughs> sir, I'm not gay, sir! Do you have a girlfriend, Swafford? Sir, yes, sir! Yes, again, mother <laughs> Jody's banging her right now! <laughs> Get in your face and give me 25 for every time she gets f this month! <laughs> Oh, oh, oh wait, hold on, hold on. There's a part here that I've always found hilarious. Right before Jake Gyllenhaal goes down and starts doing push-ups, just right behind that drill instructor's head, you could see this guy laughing. That probably was not intentional, but <laughs> stuff like that does happen. <laughs> Boot camp or basic training in my case is one of the funniest places you'll ever be in where you're not exactly allowed to laugh. You're not allowed to laugh at all because if you do, you're not going to be laughing for long. That is if a drill sergeant or drill instructor sees you. This gives me flashbacks to my squad bay in basic training. I was at Fort Benning, Georgia. This particular shot right here, they're all standing on line, as they say in the Marines. In the Army, we said, toe the line. Whenever they would say, toe the line, that meant we all had to stand at attention and wait for the drill sergeants to come out and tell us what to do next. In my case, our bunk beds were just about parallel to us. And sometimes we would just lean back to try to stay out of the eye line of the drill sergeants, try to maybe slowly look down the line and make sure they weren't seeing us. Now, as far as the uniforms, this is the late 1980s, early 1990s. This is around the time of Desert Storm. Those uniforms are what we would call BDUs, or battle dress uniforms. And the Marines have a different type of camo pattern today. It's somewhat similar looking, but it has more of a digital pixel kind of look. And before I joined the Army, this was the standard issue camouflage pattern. And they changed it to ACUs, and then they went to OCP occupational camouflage pattern or whatever it's called, I guess. I, I don't know. It's meant to reflect the type of warfare that you're going to be fighting, whether it's in the woods, in this case, the way the uniforms look, and the desert. They would change it to something very similar, which is very lighter and obviously sand colored or light brown. As far as Jake Gyllenhaal's haircut, one of the first things you're doing is that you're getting your head shaved when you go into basic training because you have to take away the individuality and you also have to present a certain level of professionalism because they're not just going to let somebody with long shaggy hair like Mick Jagger walk around in a U.S. military outfit. It, it just doesn't look good. <laughs> the way the bunks or the racks, as they call them in the Marines, it looks about the same as we had ours. And the way they hang their towels, it was a similar thing from what I can remember, at least. Although the background is way too white. It looks like they're in a psych ward at a hospital. <laughs> Even my barracks were brand new at the time when I went in. They were not that clean. <laughs> There, there's no way they would be that pristine looking. When it comes to the drill instructor <laughs> in this movie, the yelling is more or less on point. It really depends on who it is. Some drill instructors or drill sergeants in my case were not as loud or intense. Even the quieter ones or the more polite ones, if you got them upset, they would explode they would go off on you. That's kind of their job, basically. They're not supposed to be your friend. The whole point of them is to see how tough you are and how strong-willed you are in a high-stress environment. It took me a long, long time to realize that. Well, to 
get real with you guys for a second. I realize that I'm an empath. I feel my emotions really intensely and I sometimes take things way too personally when I shouldn't have. Military, it was a really hard thing for me to wrap my head around being away from home in a strange place being in a, an environment that I was really, really nervous about. Only in hindsight did I realize that they actually had our best interests at heart. If I could go back in time and take it all with a grain of salt, I probably would. But that's basically what the job is of a drill instructor or drill sergeant. Just to see how tough you can be in a stressful situation. Because as they say in various videos, if you watch any um, boot camp or basic training videos for all branches, going into combat, if you don't acclimate to what they're teaching you, when the you know what hits the fan, it's gonna be a lot worse than getting yelled at by an instructor. Sir, the recruits never been good at drawing, sir! Why the fuck are you my scribe then? Isn't my scribe supposed to know how to draw? Sir, the recruit doesn't know, the recruit thought the scribe was supposed to write, sir! Of course the recruit doesn't know! Oh boy. The recruit doesn't know because I haven't told him! Okay, he calls him the scribe. That's basically the platoon artist. We had something like that when I was in basic training. We had a guy in my platoon who studied art, so he liked to draw and do painting and all that kind of stuff. So the drill sergeants assigned him to draw the mascot and come up with the motto or the catchphrase of our platoon. And the drill instructor grabbing him by the neck like that, that, that would not fly today in today's military. And we'll get to that in a second, because if you've seen the movie, you know what happens in the next few seconds. Show me exactly where your skivvies and running shoes go. Hey, the recruit can't think while the drill instructor is hitting him on his head, sir. You can't think while I'm giving you a few left taps? Oh, 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 wait a minute. If you listen to him, he's actually saying, sir, the recruit can't think. He, he's referring to himself as this recruiter, the recruit or whatever. The Marines are so, so hypersensitive about that. I've seen various videos of boot camp, and you are not supposed to refer to yourself as I, me, or my. You have to refer to yourself as this recruit or refer to an, another trainee or whatever as that recruit or these recruits. Hey, my back, sir! Let's go! Oh, my! My! Hi, sir! This recruit! This recruit! This recruit! Hi, yes, sir! Hi, yes, sir! Hi, yes, sir! Hi, yes, sir! It's supposed to take away that individuality and build yourself up into a Marine in their case. And we didn't have something like that when I was in the Army. We would refer to ourselves as I, and the drill sergeants never batted an I. <laughs> Apologize for the pun. But I've seen plenty of videos of a recruit accidentally saying I or whatever, and the drill instructor will blow their stack. I mean, blow up like Mount St. Helens. How the f are you going to fire your rifle when grenades are going off in your face? What the f are you even doing here? Sir! I got lost on the way to college, sir! Okay, first of all, you never mouth off back to a drill instructor or a drill sergeant, because they will not have it. I did not see something like that happen when I was in. There's a lot of oversight and regulations in the military that you're not supposed to be physically abusing trainees or recruits. The only time a drill sergeant was allowed to put their hands on us was if they're making a correction or a demonstration to the other trainees in the area, or if they feel that you're a danger to them or to yourself. My personal opinion, I don't wanna get too deep into this, I think it's a pretty reasonable regulation, although I can see the other side of it where some people from previous generations see that as the military going too soft, and I understand where that comes from. I've talked to other people who served in the army before. I had a manager in one of my previous jobs who served in Vietnam in the US Army. I believe it was the 25th Infantry Division. He was telling me how basic was for him and how one of his drill sergeants, when they were having their night off, he kind of talked to them really calmly, saying, hey, look, it's gonna be tough, but if you just listen to me and do as I tell you, everything will be fine. And then the next morning when training starts, apparently the drill sergeant said, Privates, you're about to piss me off. You're really gonna piss me off right now. The same thing happened to us when I was in basic training. The drill sergeant said something very similar. So in that respect, it wasn't too different from what I went through. But I think back then, from what I've heard, and also what I've read, they would get away with stuff like punching you or slapping you or smacking you on the backside of their hand just to try to keep you in line. And I think ultimately what happened was that there were some trainees or recruits that didn't really have a thick skin and felt the need to complain to their superiors. Also, on the other side of that coin, I think there were just a handful of drill sergeants and instructors that felt the need to abuse their power. and basically thump their chests at their recruits. This is just my own observation. Anyone can tell me if I'm wrong, please politely in the comments section. I don't wanna cause a huge fuss over this. I just know if that were to happen right now, 
that drill instructor would be in serious trouble. As far as Jarhead itself, it's not a bad movie. It's, it was a very different type of military theme movie than I was expecting. I was expecting it to be Saving Private Ryan in Desert Storm, and I didn't really get that. It was a very different type of conflict that the US military fought in. The war didn't really last that long. In fact, I don't really think I would call it a war. It probably lasted about a month. The movie can sometimes feel a bit slow and uneventful, and that's basically I think a very realistic portrayal of how military life can be when you're overseas. Not that I would know, I never deployed overseas, but I've come to realize over the years what the intention of the movie was. It was meant to show a different type of war that the military was taking part in in the years after Vietnam. Maybe one day I'll talk about it in more depth. And now, Full Metal Jacket. I talked about this movie a few years ago and I didn't really quite get what the meaning of the movie was. I'll address that maybe in the future at some point, but uh, let's talk about probably most famous part of the movie, and that's the drill instructor, Gunnery Sergeant Hartman. I am Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, your senior drill instructor. From now on, you will speak only when spoken to, and the first and last words out of your filthy sewers will be, sir. Do you maggots understand that? Sir, sir yes, sir. Bull I can't hear you. Sound off like you got a pair. Sir, yes, sir. You are cute. You're in the lowest form of life on earth. I am hard, but I am fair. There is no racial bigotry here. Here you are all equally worthless. And my orders are to weed out all non-hackers who do not pack the gear to serve in my beloved car. Arlie Ermey is probably the biggest reason why people remember this movie. He was actually the military advisor for Stanley Kubrick, but the actor that they hired to play the drill instructor wasn't originally him. It was this guy that you later see in the helicopter who's firing his machine gun on the civilians in the fields below. But inevitably they decided that his portrayal of the drill instructor wasn't really meshing with what they were envisioning for the character. And Arlie Ermey was actually a Marine at one point in his life, served for 11 years, did a tour in Vietnam, and was actually a drill instructor for two years at Paris Island. No, sorry, San Diego, my, my fault. Drill sergeants and drill instructors, they have a way of getting their point across by showing their recruits or trainees that they're there to make them as miserable as they can, so that way they can unite in order to be the best Marines or soldiers that they can be. When you look past all that stuff, they're just normal people. They're not walking around angry or mad all the time. It's just a job that they have to do. And that's another thing that took me a long, long time to realize about dr my drill sergeants. And Stanley Kubrick usually was very meticulous and structured in the way he crafted his movies. This was an exception though. He allowed Arlie Ermey to improv a lot of his lines and ad lib some of the things that he felt was necessary to convey what was required for the character. And it only took about maybe two or three takes for them to finally get it right. And I think in that way, it worked in the film's favor. Unfortunately, with the character of Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, it led to the stereotype that people have of drill sergeants and drill instructors. And I think even Arlie Ermey said that it's not exactly how he would have led his recruits while he was a drill instructor. I, I could be wrong on that, but I think I read somewhere that that's how he felt about it. He did what he had to do for the movie, and I don't think that he regrets it, but he probably would have said, no, in real life, that's not the way I would have done it. Who knows if that's true or not, but my drill sergeants in particular asked us, was anybody here expecting the full metal jacket experience? I was one of the trainees who raised my hand. And they scoffed at us and said, well, you might as well throw those ideas out the window because you're not gonna see any of that here. And it turns out they were right. I did not have any kind of experience like that. We'll get to that in a little bit, but I was very, very worried, believe it or not, that I was gonna end up like Gomer Pyle being the unnecessary center of attention and pushed over the edge. <laughs> I laugh about it now, but at the time that shows you just how scared I really was and how inexperienced I was at everything. Oh! You little scumbag! You will not laugh! You will not cry! You will learn by the numbers! I will teach you! Now get up! Get on your feet! Yeah, just watching that, that's very exaggerated. This is a movie you kind of have to do stuff like that to take liberties with certain things. There's no way a drill sergeant would punch somebody in the stomach like that and get away with it. It's just not gonna happen. Oh, and he asked Private Cowboy, how tall are you, Private? Sir, five foot nine, sir! Five foot nine, I didn't know they stacked sh that high. Not one word of a lie. One of our drill sergeants said the exact same thing to a guy in my platoon who was six foot nine, and I almost lost it. And then he said it again a few days later to a totally different trainee, and I thought, okay, it was funny the first time, not funny the second time. We get it. But it goes to show you just how much this movie influenced basic training in the military in all branches. And then we get to the infamous Gomer Pyle, played by Vincent D'Onofrio, who you might know as Wilson Fisk from the Daredevil series in the MCU. And he looks exactly the same in this movie as he does 
in the Daredevil series. And your parents have any children that live? Sir, yes, sir. I bet they regret that. You're so ugly you could be a modern art masterpiece. What's your name, fat body? Sir, Leonard Lawrence, sir. From now on, you're Gomer Pyle. Sir, yes, sir. Do you think I'm cute, Private Pyle? Do you think I'm funny? Get on your knees, scumbag. Oh. <laughs> God. Yeah, they couldn't get away with that today. Sir, yes, sir. Sound off like you've got a pair. Sir, yes, sir. That's enough. Get on your feet. So basically, there's always that one guy in a basic training unit that takes a long time to catch on to certain things. And unfortunately, they stick out like a sore thumb. A lot of people catch on pretty quickly. Some take a little longer and then some just keep messing up consistently. I was somewhere in the middle. We'll talk about that once we get to the jelly donut scene. I had a pretty big target on my back in the drill sergeant's eyes. I had a hard time adjusting to the structure that they were trying to establish in all of us. I mean, I was doing what I was told. I just had a hard time adjusting and I let my emotions get in the way and they had their eyes on me for a while to the point where I had to do extra stuff in order to prove that I wasn't gonna be out of line. And then inevitably they were able to see, okay, I think this guy's gonna do what he was told. And for the rest of the training, they left me alone. So thankfully I was able to get that all off my back. Now in the case of Gomer Pyle, this is set during Vietnam where the draft was in place, a lot of these guys were forced to go into the military. We don't have the draft anymore. It's an all-volunteer type of military, which I'm really glad that I joined when I did because even if the draft was in place and we were in the middle of a war, I was going to join anyway just to get that off my back. I did not want to have to sit around at home waiting for my number to be called. And I know plenty of guys back in the Second World War and Vietnam did that in order to just get it all out of the way so they didn't have to wait. But someone like Gomer Pyle, not a whole lot is known about him as a character and what he was like before he entered boot camp, but if you watch him in the movie, he's very childlike, and it almost seems like he's not exactly all there upstairs. I don't think he was really the right type of guy to go into a combat scenario, and where his character ends up is very, very tragic and jaw-dropping once you see the rest of the film play out. After being the target of Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, Joker is tasked with teaching him certain things, and things seem to be improving with him because Joker's a lot more patient and soft-spoken with him. But then inevitably, he ends up throwing a bomb on everybody's lap. Let's just see if there's anything missing. Okay, that is no different from when I went through basic training. One of the drill sergeants I had in my platoon, if a wall locker was even slightly off-center or left unlocked, he literally just started shoving it and throwing it or lifting it to the point where it crashed on the floor. He even started throwing or tossing or lifting bunk beds if a towel was slightly out of place. They are that anal about everything because they're all about attention to detail. And when it comes to searching your foot locker, or in our case, a wall locker, well, we gotta see if there's anything missing. What is that private pile? Sir, jelly donut, sir. A jelly donut? Sir, yes, sir. Private pile has dishonored himself and dishonored the platoon. You people have not given Private Pyle the proper motivation. Okay, what he's saying there, you've not given Private Pyle the pop proper motivation, excuse me. He's, from what I've heard of this uh, former Marine, James Laporta, he's speaking in code. And if you see the rest of the movie, you know that they eventually use like a soap bar party. They take a bar of soap and wrap it in a towel and they smack him on the stomach with it in the middle of the night. Basically, he's saying to him, we need to haze him into compliance. He's not being overtly explicit with what he wants them to do, but anybody with a brainstem would be able to decipher what he's saying. Now get on your faces! Open your mouth! Oh boy. They're paying for it, you eat it! One, two, three, four! That's humiliating. And you could see in his face that he feels terrible. I had the exact same thing happen to me. Now, I didn't steal anything from the DFAC or the dining facility as we call it, but at one point our drill sergeants would try to get us to toe the line right at the moment where the, he wanted us to so we could actually show how disciplined we were and try to get everything in line. And I was trying to make sure I got everything in line. And my bunk mate kept saying, Joe, don't worry about it. Just get online, get online. And by the time we all said, three, two, one, lock it up, drill sergeant, lock it up. By the time I got to the line, my helmet fell off my bunk and I heard this loud thud. And I closed my eyes like this and I thought, oh crap, I'm done. And my drill sergeant saw me and he ordered me to get out in the middle of the section where we had our classroom instruction. 
in our platoon bay and he had everybody get down on their faces and do push-ups and he actually made me direct them into doing the push-ups down up and he had them all say thank you 438 that was my roster number we were fourth platoon and i was the 38th member of fourth platoon and i was humiliated and i was so crushed and i I thought that I was going to get severely hazed that night. By the time the drill sergeant told me to go back to my bunk, <laughs> I can laugh about it now in some ways, but it's still, there's a lot of emotions that I was feeling. I could still remember the one guy that was right next to me. By the time I got back to my spot, he patted me right on the shoulder as a way to say, dude, it's okay. Now, I tried really hard to fight back the tears because I was a very different person back then. <laughs> so my bunkmate who was trying to warn me, he just came right up to me and put his arms around me and told me, dude, it's okay. It's all right, just let it out. And I told him, if you guys are gonna do something to me tonight, just tell me right now so I can prepare myself. And he started laughing. Like, Joe, what are you talking about? And then he realized what I was referring to. And then he told our platoon guides, our student leadership, the lead trainees in our platoon. And at that point, it was about a couple weeks into basic training. Everybody was getting really fed up with people messing up and getting smoked as a result of it. Our platoon guide went around saying, hey guys, if you got anything up your sleeve on what to do with certain people, don't do it because you're gonna get in serious trouble and we're all gonna get in trouble. And as a result, nobody did anything because they realized that it wasn't really worth trying to do something like that. Full Metal Jacket is a very important movie and a lot of people see it as a pro-war movie. It's really not that way at all. It shows you, I think, in a lot of ways just how the military can brainwash someone into acting a certain way and then forcing them to go into a situation that they don't necessarily want to be in. In the case of Vietnam, we were fighting somebody else's conflict that happened long before we even got involved in the first place. It wasn't like World War II where our country was attacked and we felt the need to go in to fight back against the one who attacked us. Or even many, many, many decades later with 9-11, we were attacked and we felt the need to go back and strike back against the enemy. Vietnam was a very, very different type of war and unfortunately it led to a lot of dysfunction in that generation. A lot of guys came back not really sure how to cope with what they were seeing. Every conflict that America has fought has experienced that. Vietnam especially, where all the anti-war sentiments were widespread across the country, they didn't exactly receive a welcoming home party. They were basically called baby killers. If you remember the movie Forrest Gump, when Forrest meets Jenny's friend, the Black Panther party, as he calls it, he looks at him and he goes, who's the baby killer? And as where the movie ends up with Private Joker, he becomes a killer as Gunnery Sergeant Hartman wants him to, but in almost every single way, he loses his innocence and his humanity. I'll save that for a later video, but basically I think it's a very important movie in that respect to watch, especially culturally. When you see how Arlie Ermey portrays the drill instructor, it's very entertaining, but there's also a really dark side to it as well. And the scene where Gomer Pyle kills himself and kills Gunnery Sergeant Hartman, it's probably the most creepiest scene I've ever witnessed in a movie more so than any horror movie that I've watched. It's very, very effective in getting the scare factor across. Stanley Kubrick being known for movies like The Shining or Eyes Wide Shut or Clockwork Orange. He was, uh, from what I understand, a very twisted type of individual. And this movie was responsible for getting a lot of people to join the Marines in the late 1980s. This came out in 1987. And it's also caused some people to say, well, actually, I don't want to join the Marine Corps. I'll go into the Air Force, the Army. That's better. Go Army. <laughs> I'm biased because I was in the Army. There were some things that were exaggerated, like the way he lords over the recruits. That's not really the job of a drill sergeant or a drill instructor. Their job is to teach recruits and trainees how to prepare for combat. Yes, there's a lot of yelling, and in the case of the Marines, a lot of screaming. Why are you talking so slow to me like you think I'm gonna buy all this freaking dramatic crap? But it's meant to determine just how tough you really are. And lastly, brothers. Sam. What am I supposed to do now, Grace? You know what I did? To get back to you? No. You know what I did? The f you you! You know how much I love you! You know what I... You know what I can do with this f***ing ass Christ! What are you doing here? 
And that's about all I'm gonna show you from that clip because I know YouTube can be a little bit hypersensitive about the type of content that an uploader presents on here. As far as the movie Brothers, again, it's been years since I've seen it. It's about a Marine played by Tobey Maguire who is overseas in Afghanistan and he gets captured by the Taliban and is forced to do something really horrific. I won't spoil it in case you haven't seen it. It's a really dark movie and I think it's a very important movie, like I said with Full Metal Jacket, but I think that out of all the three that I've talked about in this video, it's the most important thing to talk about because this movie addresses something that doesn't really get as much attention as I would like to see it get. Again, I never saw combat, never deployed, but I know plenty of people in the military who have. I served with quite a few guys who went overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan, a couple who served in Vietnam. Tobey Maguire's character in this movie goes through a very, very traumatic experience. He has that thousand yard stare that he portrays in this movie where you can tell that he's having flashbacks and he's burying something inside that he wants to let out but he doesn't know how to convey it to the people around him because they haven't gone through the same experience as he has and he doesn't have the appropriate type of counselor that is there to listen to him. Now, I think in today's world, we would have people or support groups that would be able to talk to veterans like that. And I think from what I've heard and from what I've seen, we are taking steps in that direction, thankfully, where they're allowing veterans to talk about what they've experienced in order for them to find a way to heal from all that. I had a drill sergeant in basic training. He did three combat tours in Iraq. Three. And from what I've heard, he experienced a lot of post-traumatic stress as a result of that. He would walk around sometimes with this really blank stare in his eyes like this. I, I wasn't really sure at the time what exactly was going through his head. I thought, is something wrong with him? Once I talked to some of the guys who served under him in basic training, now it all starts to make sense. And, and he would get really animated too whenever he would get upset and start yelling at us. It was horrifying. Like, absolutely horrifying horrifying. <laughs> and after I came home from basic, when I watched the movie Brothers again, seeing Tobey Maguire's performance, I thought, that is it. This was a big departure for Tobey Maguire at the time. Very, very intense in this movie. And usually all the roles that he played prior to this were very lighthearted. Spider-Man is obviously his signature role, and he'll never really be able to escape from that. This is a side of him as an actor that not many people really talk about. You go down in the comment section on this video, you're bound to see something like, he's upset that Mr. Dickovich kicked him out of his apartment or something, or that he's just upset because Andrew Garfield took over the role of Spider-Man or whatever. <laughs> Toby's my favorite actor of all time. I'm not ashamed to say that. Some of you are probably rolling your eyes by now, but uh, I'm giving credit where it's due. He does not get as much credit as I think he deserves. He, I think, is Oscar worthy in this movie. The only recognition he got that was even close to that was for this role, he got nominated for a Golden Globe for Best Actor or Best Supporting Actor, one, one or the other. The late Roger Ebert said in his review of the movie at the time, Brothers is Tobey Maguire's film to dominate and I've never seen these dark depths in him before. If the world's greatest film critic can give you that type of praise, that should tell you something. Not just that drill sergeant I had in basic training. There were a couple other guys that I served with who did at least one tour in Iraq and they had maybe not that quite of an intense stare in their face, but there was at least something boiling under the surface where you can tell that they saw something when they were over there. And in my estimation, Toby's portrayal of that is spot on. Thank you guys so much for watching this. Would you like to see more of this? I got plenty of ideas in mind for other war films or other types of military themed movies or maybe I'll even do one on Band of Brothers. I did a episode by episode review of that series and I never got around to finishing it. One of these days I think I will. I just have to find the right time to do it. If you'd like to see more of this, just let me know. Thank you guys so much again for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Like what you see? Don't forget to like and subscribe.